He was working under canvas about a year ago, almost exactly a year ago, actually, in earthquake hit Haiti. Conditions were appalling. He and his uh, fellow doctors and surgeons were told to expect 400 casualties in the coming days. But Chris is used to that, you see. He's part of an incredible organisation called Doctors of the World. He's the Oxfordshire surgeon who stood shoulder to shoulder with the bravest of the brave in Afghanistan. And it's all because Victoria was sat with him on a sofa one night, his partner, and thought he was getting a little dull. <laughs> <laughs> That's almost what started it. Chris, good morning. Good morning. Lovely to see you again. Thank you. Let me take you back a year ago today, take you back to that canvas and Haiti. What were times like for you? I don't think when we first came into Port-au-Prince we had any idea of what we were dealing with. It, Port-au-Prince is an extraordinary place. It's a shanty town, but it's got the same population as Birmingham, so it is absolutely huge. And as we came into the city, we suddenly realised the whole city was flat. There was nothing left. And as soon as we started work in the hospital, as soon as the word was out there was another surgical team available, the stretchers were lined up as far as the eye could see. There was just so much work to be done. And how did that affect you? What did you think? Did you think... I don't know what I've got myself in for here. I don't know how I'm going to cope with this. Did that thought ever cross your mind, Chris? Yes, of course it did, and I'm sure it crossed the mind of the whole team. But in fact, we had a strong team. Some of us had done this work before, and so we tried to look as if we were... This was everyday work. It wasn't everyday work. It was like nothing anyone has ever seen before. But we all looked after each other. But there were moments when you stopped in your tracks and thought, I I'm not sure I... I can go on with this because it's just so horrendous. And, and, but I suppose one of the beauties of being a surgeon is that you've got a job of work to do and, and you better get on with it. What sort of things were the people coming to you with? I've just mentioned you were told to expect 400 casualties over the next few days. Did you have 400? No, it was nearer 4,000. We only dealt with, we, our team only dealt with 400, but the stretchers were spread out as far as the eye could see. There were American teams working in the next room to us and then um, Norwegian teams beyond that. But we had a very strong team, so we did a, a lot of the work. But, of course, a lot of the patients just didn't get any treatment at all. It was all too late. But what, what was awful was they'd been crushed. That was the main problem, that they'd been trapped in buildings. And personally, I can't imagine anything more horrid than being trapped inside a building with crushed by masonry and wondering whether anyone was going to ever get you out, whether they are going to find you and get you in time. Yes. What sort of injuries did they have and how did you go about repairing these, these people? Well, we had to use basic techniques and simple techniques. There was no time to use sophisticated stuff and we didn't have any proper anaesthetic equipment and we didn't have any proper orthopaedic fixation equipment either. So we had lots of broken legs and broken arms um, and so we treated those with plaster of Paris mainly, just good old-fashioned plaster of Paris. And then these crushed wounds are much more difficult to deal with because they kill the leg or the arm that's been crushed but they can also destroy their kidneys and so they go into kidney failure and so we had huge problems dealing with them. As a person, Chris, how did you keep yourself normal? Um, I don't think you do keep normal when, you, when you're doing a job like that. Every waking moment is absolutely flat out organising supplies, bringing patients in, finding more patients, working out what's happened to the last ones. So there's no time to think in a funny sort of way, the shock comes afterwards when you get back home and you sit down and suddenly realise what it is you've been through. But at the time, it's just a blur. Mm. I wonder if you still see the faces of the people or some of the people that uh, you looked after and tried to help. Of course you do. And 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 they, they float back in front of you. Some of them we're going to see again. We had two young surgeons in Haiti, who, who, although their houses had collapsed and they got nowhere to live, turned up to work in the hospital at dawn every morning and worked throughout the day. They were absolutely fantastic. And we're going to get them to come to Oxford next month and do some training with us, and then they go on to France to do some more training. And that's just a little thank you to them, because it was, it was hard for us, but it must have been devastating for them, with, with nowhere for their families to live, nothing. That's an incredible gesture. What do they think about that? These two uh, doctors, these two surgeons from Haiti, they didn't have their house, as Chris has just said, even. Yet they turned up for work every day. They were that determined. They were that disciplined. They were that eager to help. What do they think of your gesture? Well, I think at first they were a bit 
um, worried by me because I'm quite strict when I'm doing my medicine and oh. my first interaction with them was to tell them to stand up straight in ward rounds, take their hands out of their pockets and stop chewing gum, but I was not <laughs> going to have that. What I hadn't realised was they had nowhere to live, they had actually hadn't eaten that day or anything. And, and once we settled down, I made this promise and I could see from their eyes, oh yes, this is another promise of a Westerner, like the money you've promised and like all the other things you promised, you won't deliver. So when I came back, I was quietly determined that we would deliver and Doctors of the World have been fantastic with that and an organisation called the Rain Foundation just clicked their fingers and said, yep, we like that, let's make it happen. And when is it going to happen? Then next month they're coming oh. here and then they go on to... When France heard, when Médecins du Monde heard in France that we were doing this, they were incandescent and they've <laughs> offered an even better programme. So it's really sort of catapulted forward. So we're going to have them over in, in, Fra in England and France for four months during the summer and we're going to show them orthopaedics as we do it here. We're going to teach them how to be teachers because I think they're going to be leaders as doctors in Haiti in the future and we're going to do some leadership courses with them. We've got a whole rack of things to do with them to try and help them take Haiti out of this terrible situation in the future. Yeah, is there hope for Haiti? Doing things like you're doing in Oxford, that shows there maybe is. I just don't know whether there's a hope for Haiti. It's just such a difficult situation. They're having such a rotten time, but there are wonderful people there and maybe they'll come out at the end and make it happen. Tell me about Doctors of the World and why you joined. Was it really because you almost felt yourself getting into a rut? Yes, I think so. Um, and I've always been passionate about working in the third world. And yeah. what we're now seeing developing is NGOs like Doctors of the World who are real professionals about the third world because there's nothing amateurish about working there. You've got to be very well organised, you've got to be very strategic and you've got to think what you're doing. And there are various NGOs, I mean Oxfam, Save the Children, who are the top end with Doctors of the World of the kind of organisation that can really throw the right resources at a problem, not just a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And I've been very interested in how they plan and think forward about how to be ready for things and how to help best. What is your next job? What is your next adventure? Well, I'm, we're looking next with Doctors of the World at a long strategic plan. Um, Bangladesh is a very poor country and they don't have any um, top orthopaedic services. They don't have any hip replacements and any knee replacements. And Doctor of the World is looking at a possible program to try and set up a new hospital there where we'd be able to do it. It's not going to be easy and we've got to tread very, very lightly, but my job, if it works out, will be to try and train up the local surgeons in the standards of hygiene that we need and the quality of the surgery that we need so that they can have a joint replacement service like we rather take for granted here in Oxford. Yes, what does Oxford mean to you when you come back and have a, and I'll use the word again, normal spell? Well, it's, it's, how, it's, it, it's sort of difficult because sometimes it's quite frustrating when I hear my colleagues complaining about lack of resources and I think well gosh I wish you'd seen one or two things that I've seen and 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 realized how very lucky we are I and mean, I know that John Radcliffe's going through massive financial problems at the moment but actually we do live in a very wealthy country and it is a fabulous hospital we do have some great doctors and so just as I'm about to start grumbling, I button my lip and oh. just get on with the work. Oh. And uh, what's this you say about... Listen to this, everybody. The John Radcliffe Hospital not having enough sick people for the students. Have a listen to that, what I've just said. Not enough sick people for the students. Chris, what's this all about? It, it, I know it sounds a crazy situation, but the John Radcliffe now has far fewer beds than it had before, and people stay in for a very short time. So almost all the patients who are in a bed in the hospital are about to have a test done or about to go home. Now, the poor medical students have got to learn from seeing patients, and they need time, and they mustn't be distracted or taken away. And there's very rarely time for a student to have an hour with a patient, finding out what's wrong with them, taking a history, doing an examination. And so the poor students are, are getting very... F uh, well, I think they're getting very fretful about they're not seeing, having a chance to see n enough patients. Because every time they go and see a patient, income system says, no, no, you've got to stop now, they've got to go off for their CAT scan or whatever happens. And we had a sort of idea of whether there are people out in the community who've got 
problems, ongoing problems with them, who might be prepared to volunteer to come to the hospital to a sort of imaginary ward. We might sort of set up in the gymnasium there a sort of virtual ward, and they could be patients for half a day, and the students could come round and see them and take a history and examine their physical signs at leisure, where there's no pressure on anyone, the patients have volunteered, students got plenty of time. I just wonder whether that's not something we're going to have to think about in the future. I mean, I know a lot of GPs do it at the moment. Lawrence Lever down in, in um, Jericho does that with his patients, and several other GPs do it. But maybe we need to do something quite big and mm. county-wide in Oxfordshire to try and help those students learn to be the good doctors of the future. Well, it's a plan that we'll uh, lend our support to if we may, on BBC Radio Oxford, on this show for sure. Um, look, wherever you go in the world, Chris, our best wishes go with you because we think you're amazing, actually, fantastic, and your stories are as well. Keep up the good work is all I can say. We're in awe of you, actually, and uh, you're always welcome to come and tell those stories on BBC Radio Oxford with us, and I hope you do for many, many months to come. Thank you so much, Malcolm. That's Chris's story, Chris Bolstrode.